Welcome to the third presentation on TBS. We are now proceeding to the secondary survey, which focuses on history and resuscitation. The secondary survey is, in many ways, the classic history and physical examination. This is appropriate once the primary survey has been done and the patient has been stabilized. Changes in neurological status are observed in the secondary survey, and a more detailed evaluation is conducted than in the primary survey. Inspect the scalp in the head and face. Look for bleeding or lacerations. Gently palpitate any irregularities in the skull to detect skull fractures. Periorbital bruising and or mastoid bruising is indicative of a base of skull fracture. Chest. Inspect the chest for injuries, bruising, contusions, or penetrating wounds. Listen to breath sounds and assess for respiratory distress. Check for flail chest, paradoxical chest movement, or tension, pneumothorax. Abdomen. Palpate the abdomen for tenderness, rigidity, or signs of internal injuries. Listen for bowel sounds. Look for abdominal bruising or distension, pelvis and extremities. Check for pelvic fractures or instabilities. Press on the iliac crests, assessing for pain. Examine the extremities for fractures, dislocation, deformities, swelling, and open wounds. Evaluate extremity circulation by checking capillary refill, pulses, and skin color. Assess the back of the patient for any injuries or deformities. To assess the back, you must log roll the patient to avoid spinal cord injury. Reevaluate the patient's neurological status, including the level of consciousness, pupil size, and reactivity, motor strength, and sensory responses. Monitor for changes in neurological signs, which can indicate worsening brain injury or other neurological issues. Examine the skin for additional injuries, abrasions, lacerations, or burns. Document any pressure, ulcers, or signs of skin breakdown, especially if the patient is immobilized for an extended period. Monitor vital signs, including heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. Record all findings and assessments accurately for future reference and communication with other healthcare providers. The minimal history is the ample history. Check for allergies and medications that can alter CNS status and alert you to underlying conditions. History including last meal and preparation for surgery and events in particular details about loss of consciousness. Road traffic crashes, falls, assaults, and gunshot wounds can all lead to TBIs. The mechanism of injury can provide insight into the level of force involved. The timeline of care and interventions are important management details. Alcohol impairs judgment and coordination, which increases susceptibility to injury and TBIS. We should always suspect traumatic brain injury in patients with alcohol intoxication and a history of trauma with impaired consciousness. Assess whether alcohol was a contributing factor to the injury. Loss of consciousness following a head injury is a critical concern, and the duration of us. Loss of consciousness provides information about the severity. The presence of lucid interval may indicate an epidural hematoma. Ear or nose bleeding indicates potential basal skull. Fractures a serious condition which is often associated with underlying brain injury. Tsitsuras are an indication of brain damage which should be managed promptly. Avoid hypocoxia, ensure airway maintenance, and provide oxygen. Signs of ICP include weakness of the extremities and dilated and non-reactive pupils. This requires immediate attention and intervention. To reduce ICP, a post-resuscitation neurological assessment provides a more reliable and accurate picture of the patient's status than an unstable patient's assessment. Patients should be categorized according to the severity of TBI. Those patients having a GCS of 14 or 15 are categorized as mild TBI, while those between 9 and 13 are I. Or moderate TBI patients. Patients with a GCS of less than 9 are severe TBI patients. The patient's eye opening is scored from 1 to 4. 
The patient's motor response is scored from one to six. The patient's verbal response is scored from one to five. In addition to assessing eye opening in the GCS, examining pupil size and light response is crucial to evaluating neurological status. Anisocoria is a significant clinical finding and may indicate underlying neurological issues or trauma. The response of the pupils to light is assessed and described. In cases of a supertentorial brain injury, the pupil on that side may dilate. This is known as ipsilateral dilation. Serial pupil examinations over time are crucial. Changes in size, reactivity, or anisocoria can indicate neurological deterioration. Pupil abnormalities can be among the first signs of neurological deterioration. Recognizing these changes promptly is essential for patient management. The findings from pupil examination can determine the need for diagnostic tests neurosurgical interventions, or adjustments in the patient's treatment. In summary, pupil examination, including pupil size and light response assessment, is an integral part of the Glasgow Coma Scale, GCS, and is crucial in assessing and monitoring the neurological status of head injuries. The patient should be transferred for definitive care. This can be within your institution to the operating room or an external referral.